Welcome everyone. I'm Taylor Walsh, Executive Director of Whole Health Ed. On behalf of our co-host, Adam Shriver, Director of Wellness and Nutrition Policy at the Harkin Institute, we want to welcome you to this series of videos from our June 2023 symposium, First Line of Defense, Confronting the Adolescent Mental Health Crisis Through Interdisciplinary Whole Child Actions in K-12. In this video, Senator Tom Harkin, founder of the Institute, opens the conversation. During his time in the Senate, Senator Harkin was the leading advocate for improving the nation's health and health care system. I'll say a few words, followed by my partner, Dr. Larry Rosen, for many years a national leader in whole child pediatrics. Larry will lay out the challenging state of children's mental health, health and well-being, the urgency it presents, and how schools are ready to help. Here is Senator Harkin. Good morning. I am pleased to introduce today's discussions on creative ways to address the very disturbing adolescent mental health crisis that our Surgeon General Vivek Murthy has made his most important policy issue. We're glad that our foundational work at the Harkin Institute to ensure equitable food quality and access in all American communities is part of this conversation. The idea that schools already have access to multiple activities uh, shown to support student mental health, which in turn can sustain their growth and success in academics and school life, is one that needs much greater attention. In many ways, emphasizing the value of multiple activities like gardening and mindfulness practices, cooking, spending time in nature, reminds me of our experience in the 1990s and 2000s when leaders in healthcare innovation, some of whom are with us today, I'm happy to note, developed policies and programs to ensure that patients and providers had equitable access to multiple therapies then widely used by the public, but not part of the standard system of care. Today, acupuncture, massage therapy, food as medicine, mind body, and other measures are becoming much more widely available. It's heartening to see that one of the outcomes of those efforts, emphasizing professional guidance to improve personal adult lifestyle factors like diet, exercise, stress management, and social connections, have dovetailed with the school garden and other activities to create a potent whole health learning framework. And the idea of incorporating this comprehensive learning experience at the very beginning of children's time in school offers great potential to offset the stress and anxiety kids are facing every day and to put them on a path that prevents the onset of chronic illness in their adult years. So again, welcome to this conversation. Uh, and uh, please uh, note that uh, we will be following this up uh, with our interactions again with NIH. Thank you again for participating. Great. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to um, my co-organizer, Taylor Walsh. So Taylor, take it away. Well, uh, thank you, um, Adam, and thank you, um, Senator Harkin, for for those comments today. Thank everybody for joining us. It's really a great pleasure to be with people we've been engaging with for the last couple of years and joining together. And this is an occasion for us to say happy fifth birthday to Whole Health Ed. There you see a similar type of a uh, group that got together at Georgetown University five years ago and started to answer the question, that we still have today, and that is, what if? So the what if is, uh, uh, if we put an array of ancillary and supplemental programs found at thousands of schools across the country, were pulled together, unified, and made part of a single learning framework. Each of them has long since been integrated into academics. Research in recent years shows positive outcomes on mental, emotional, and behavioral health. And they were continued to be supported today by thousands of specialists, adherents, and educators, and community folks. Strangely enough, these conditions reminded me of those just before 
stem was created, which is to say, before the existential threat to the nation began circling the earth in 1957 when the Russians launched Sputnik. The challenge was clear and the might of the nation was reorganized to meet it, fusing together capabilities and traditions of four discrete disciplines into a unified whole, science, technology, engineering, and math, of course. When Larry and I uh, connected, Larry Rosen and I connected, we shared a deep concern for what similar existential threat to the nation, and that's the declining health of the population and the disturbing impact of childhood obesity, substance abuse, negative social determinants, adverse childhood experiences, and, and illnesses emerging, uh, emerging in childhood we hadn't seen before. So we thought, let's bring together a group to Georgetown to consider this what-if question. What if there were a compelling health and learning continuum that could begin to grapple with this declining state of children's health in new ways among new partners stretching beyond their usual approach. The most compelling outcome of that first gathering occurred when our colleague, Kate Tumulty Felice, who was here, returned home to South Jersey and implemented her version of what if, which is, what if we did this right now? So four months later, the semester long, the first semester long program of whole health studies began at Lakeside Middle School in New Jersey. Kate enlisted wellness in the schools, who's here today, to conduct kitchen workshops, the Holistic Life Foundation, Baltimore for Mental Health Practices, Mindful, pra mindful Practices, I should Oh, are you on your way? The uh, outcomes of that simple implementation were compelling. Great. So I thought, you. what if I'm we could cut it. and paste this time's 100,000 schools? Well, that's to be seen, right? Since then, of course, the depletion of kids' health and well being has exploded. The true impact of what it looks like when an existential threat is actually apparent has become evident most recently in, in the reported decline in student test scores this week. But even then they missed the point. Here's a headline, more bad news for test scores. That's not it. It's more bad news for the well-being of the 13 year olds who took those tests. So learning loss, yes, is in plain sight. It is even more consequential. Uh, the even more consequential well-being loss that underlies the disruptions of adolescent mental health that the Surgeon General, as Senator points out, are, are most his, his most important public health crisis. You know, as Larry has said, we're not going to solve this mental health crisis one consult or treatment at a time. The shortfall of school psychologists and counselors is pronounced, and appointments for private practice are hard to come by. So the question is, how in the world do we deal with, at scale, this often terrifying set of conditions stacked up and looming over these folks, over these kids? Well, we can start maybe in the school garden. The key to the school garden is where it is located and where all these activities are located, which is inside the nation's K-12 school infrastructure, a confounding, perplexing superstructure of hope if there ever was one. But I haven't been able to shake the idea that ultimately, the answer to how do we meet these challenges at scale quickly and most cost effectively is going to begin on the school campus. The improvements we all seek really aren't a healthcare task, though improving health is absolutely fundamental. This is a learning task, you know, one that asks educators to place strengthening children's well being and resilience into the core of their missions. So today we'll hear from folks whose work in those usually ancillary programs has made the case for this kind of stretching. Having served thousands of schools and millions of children already, the proof of concept, and we, we believe, is done. So I want to thank everyone for coming. We're thrilled to, to uh, invite you in and to, to define this, this uh, conversation and, and learn more about what you think what might be done with if, if we get going on this. So with that, I want to turn this over to my partner, Larry Rosen, who is a uh, pediatrician in North Jersey, who uh, is a professor uh, at pediatrics at the, uh, the uh, Hackensack Meridian School of Medicine, 
and who's had a lot of experience on many levels dealing with pediatric health and whole child well-being. So, Larry, I leave it to you. Thank you, Taylor. Thank you for um, putting this together. I think we all owe you a debt of thanks for your continued stewardship and uh, holding space for what I think is really um, the more that I, I get involved in this work, maybe the work of our lives. I'm not sure by the end of our lives we'll have achieved what we need to do, but it's a really worthy goal. And I think we, we are moving closer to where we need to be. So uh, I was given the job to set the table here and talk about the state of where we are so that we can plant some seeds and understand the scope of the issue. Uh, you can go to the next slide, please. Um, and I think I keep coming back and I use quotes like this and images like this to remind us that uh, many politicians, writers, thought leaders across the centuries have echoed this comment. And yet in the United States, we continue to not live up to these uh, moral challenges. Let's go to the next slide. So this is a graph many of you may have seen, um, which puts the United States in context of other countries around the world, and it compares life expectancy at birth with health expenditure per capita. And as many of you might know, in the United States, we spend much more dollars per person on health care. The results continue to be terrible, frankly. And I start this way because I think there's a tendency to think if we only can invest more money in certain areas, then we'll have better outcomes. This is not a question of spending enough money. It's about how we are spending the money and a philosophical difference about how we can make up this difference. And I will just point out recent data points out that the gap is widening over the last three years since the COVID pandemic. Let's go to the next slide. I'm gonna focus for a minute on, on really the most um, egregious and terrible situation that we're seeing. And I know this is, this is uh, I find this terribly upsetting as a pediatrician for 30 years. When I read headlines like this from the New York Times, um, it echoes what I am seeing in my practice. And I'm starting with really the tip of the iceberg um, when we talk about the most extreme uh, suffering that we see in kids today. It's suicidality. This is the really extreme end of anxiety and depression data that we all read about. I'm going to show you a short clip in a second from a, a trailer from a movie that really emphasizes this, but I really want to point out, uh, and I will just share with you this week, I have several kids who have spent time in emergency rooms for mental health issues, and one has been there three times in the last seven days. Kids are spending weeks waiting for psychiatric beds and placement around the country. This is, this is a disaster. And so if we can go to the next slide, you'll see a clip from a, an upcoming documentary that spells this out. We've been in the emergency department around 26 times in the past two years. The longest time Cecilia's had to be in the emergency department was eight days. She was eight years old. We are really in a crisis state for children's mental health. There are many days and many children for whom we don't have a psychiatric bed anywhere in the community. We all feel like we're in the middle of a war right now. We've got children we can move on languishing to the next slide, in emergency Here. departments Here. for days, weeks. We've heard stories of the, the worst cases of close to months. Thanks, and we can go to the next slide. I just wanted to show you a short clip from um, the organization Speak Our Minds. This is data that backs up what you've seen in the clip. This is pre-COVID. You'll see that the curve ends in 2019. There's been a rapid rise over the 10 years uh, from 20, 2009 to 2019 uh, in all genders, but particularly in females. This is emergency room visits for self-inflicted injuries. I think you could see this curve if you were 100 feet away from the screen. We can go to the next slide, please. 
This is from Washington State, and this takes this picks up from where that curve left off. And I think, as all of us might expect, things did not get better during the peak years of the pandemic as we've come into 2021. And I'll say the data preliminarily in the last two years continues to worsen in terms of self-harm and suspected suicide cases by age. You can see this chart includes six to 12-year-olds. Next slide. This is happening across the board, across our country, but it is particularly um, pointing out that there continue to be groups at higher risk, ranging from geographic location to um, racial and ethnic minorities. Uh, and I will point out all of these groups are at higher risk uh, that adverse childhood experiences, uh, which is the last bullet point here, is one of the um, most important factors uh, leading to poor adverse health outcomes for all adults. Go to the next slide. This is Dr. Childs, who's a psych uh, psychologist at Yale, um, pointed out, pandemics just turning up the volume on a soundtrack that was already playing. This is not new information. Those of us that have been working with kids for many years have realized that something during the last 10 to 15 years has shifted dramatically. Next slide. This is the million dollar question. Uh, and there is a lot of debate. There have been a number of articles and, and publications addressing this. I've listed some of the speculated causes. My suspicion is that data will support all of these to some degree. This is also what we hear in surveys from teenagers. If you just sit down and speak with them, you will hear all of these things happening. And we try to locate what are the actionable items? What are things we can be doing? Um, over and over again, one of the things we come back to is this change. And if you look at when the changes started to happen, it has to do with digital life and screen time. Next slide. I'm not showing this to say this is the only reason it's not, but the strongest data su supports that this is one of the driving curves. This is um, information about time spent in various activities from 2006 to 2017. And if you think about the advent of social media, portable digital technology, really starting around 2007, 2008, you'll see what happens with the curves. As internet hours, and that's a little bit outdated, I think we would, we would um, just call that digital media or screen time hours continues to increase. Look at the other things that decrease. Most importantly, overall happiness. Next slide. So much so that the Surgeon General and Senator Harkin um, noted that uh, Dr. Murthy's work has been in working in adolescent mental health. Most recently, this advised you about an epidemic of loneliness and isolation. When you talk to kids about their mental health and the struggles that they're having around digital media, a lot of it has to do with isolation, which again was only worsened by the isolation during the pandemic. Next slide. What has been the response in the US to date? Next slide. We will not be surprised to see that this has been the response in part. These are headlines from a New York Times article, uh, as was the first New York Times article, a really um, moving series about adolescent mental health, that the number of prescriptions of medications has risen dramatically. The data on the right is from the NHS in the UK talking about primary care doctors prescribing medications for children under 18 and a steady increase over the past five years. The response of the medical system, which is of no surprise, is to add medical care. That is what we do in this country. And I am not saying that medication or psychiatrists are not important and that tertiary care is not important, but we invest a woefully small percentage of our budgets and mental health in primary health promotion. Next slide. On the school end, and you'll hear more about this from educators who are much more knowledgeable than I am about what's happening, the amount of money put into the school system and funding during the stimulus for COVID is tremendous, billions and billions of dollars. You can see the numbers here. What has the result been? a decrease in health markers, and as this week's headlines will say, scores continue to decline to the lowest levels we've seen in 20 or 30 years. Next slide. 
it is very clear that what we are doing is not working. So when we think about that, and we think about what's going on, what have we been doing, what needs to change, it's important to frame this as what do we know would be the most effective, cost-effective, and equitable solution to promote the health and well-being of children. Next slide. I want to give you a framework to think about this. This is a story we use in our medical school when we teach our students about social determinants of health and the vast impact that addressing those has on health outcomes. So the story goes like this. There's a person standing by the side of the river observing that people keep falling into the river and a variety of volunteers keep throwing them life preservers so that they don't drown. And one person in this group who's helping these dozens of people who keep falling into the river thinks to themselves, I, I wonder what's happening and walks upstream and realizes that there's a bridge that has been deteriorating, falling down, and that people are falling into the river upstream. And the person decides the best outcome here would be to fix the bridge upstream. So to address the structural issues happening. Go to the next slide. The CDC has taken this paradigm and framework uh, a number of years ago, and we have very clear data showing that if you address the underlying foundational structural issues in health and wellness, you have a much greater impact on health overall. This is for physical and mental health. So that by addressing foundational structural reasons, and we're going to talk about specifically what that is in our case, 80% of the impact we can have comes from these strategies. And next slide. Lloyd Colby's article talks about when we're addressing structural causes, both in the educational world and in terms of health and public health and well-being, we, we must start with schools. Because as he points out, schools materially influence both health and education. Let's go to the next slide. So if we think about what is our greatest opportunity to address the things that we're talking about and the issues in society today, I want, and I'm planting this seed because we're going to keep coming back to this through the afternoon, what are our community centers that have the greatest impact on our children's overall health and well-being? Those are schools. And if we truly want to have an impact at the greatest level, why are we not investing in health in schools in a way that will significantly impact health and well-being over a lifespan? Until we do that, we are not going to see any significant positive change in outcomes. As Dr. Murthy points out in his adolescent mental health um, publication, if we can seize this moment, step up for our kids and their families in their moment of need and lead with inclusion, kindness, and respect, then we can lay the foundation for a healthier, more resilient, more fulfilled nation. And I would say, amen. And I think what this is going to require is thought and willpower. And so with that, I will turn it back to our hosts. Thank you so much, Larry. Thank you for that. Thanks for watching. In other videos, you'll hear from the leaders of Whole Health Learning Practices whose years of partnerships with schools and school districts have shown the potential to mitigate some of the issues Dr. Rosen described and to strengthen children's learning and social skills. You'll hear how educators might embrace these programs and how the first line of defense idea complements national post-COVID community restoration and resilience initiatives now underway. See the links in the description below.